Cognitive Neuroscience Bite Size. With Jamie Ward, University of Sussex, author of The Student's Guide to Cognitive Neuroscience and The Student's Guide to Social Neuroscience. In today's Cognitive Neuroscience Bite Size, we're going to consider auditory processes in the brain. So hearing, like vision, involves interpreting the information that's given. It's not just uh, a question of passively uh, receiving information. The brain actively constructs its own interpretation. So if we give it an ambiguous stimulus such as this... Laurel. Laurel. Some people hear this as Yanni, and others hear it as Laurel. Laurel. If you heard it as Yanni, go and show it to one of your friends, and I'm sure you won't have to go far before you find somebody who hears Laurel. Or if you heard Laurel, show it to somebody else and you'll find somebody who hears Yanni. So what's going on here? Well, this is an ambiguous stimulus. It doesn't have any context, and it's got a lot of complex information, different frequencies um, within that, and different uh, changes in frequency over time. And some people's brain might interpret it one way, and others another way. And this is something that the brain always does. It's trying to make sense of the information that's given rather than just passively process it. Hearing has a number of differences uh, to vision. So in vision, it's got very good what we call spatial resolution. Vision is very good at telling things apart in space. Hearing, on the other hand, has very good temporal resolution. So it can detect when things are happening. The word temporal means time, it's not referring to the temporal lobes in this instance. So um, hearing can detect rhythm, so um, pulses that, that are there in sound, the, the brain can detect these and discriminate them well, whereas flashes in the visual domain, the, the time signature of that are not detected as well. So hearing is very good at detecting fine temporal information. And of course, many of the things we rely on hearing for, such as understanding speech, has a rapidly changing acoustic signal that is well adapted to this kind of information processing. And similarly in the brain, the auditory cortex, which is um, the main cortical projection from the ear, has what we call a tonotopic um, representation, whereas the early visual cortex has a retinotopic organisation. What that means is, is that the visual cortex is organised such that uh, neurons in uh, adjacent locations respond to adjacent um, points in space, whereas neurons in um, adjacent parts of the auditory cortex respond to adjacent frequencies. So um, a neuron here might respond to sounds of 200 hertz and a neuron here might respond to um, sounds of 210 hertz and so on. So it's as if the auditory cortex has a frequency map um, of sounds, whereas the visual cortex has a spatial map of the, uh, the visual input. In other respects, there are similarities between visual processes and auditory processes in terms of the way that information goes uh, from the early sensory systems, the eyes or the ears, uh, into the brain. So both involve several pathways that go through um, nuclei near the thalamus. So in vision, this is the lateral geniculate nucleus, and in hearing, it's the medial geniculate nucleus. So they've got these parallel pathways, one for vision, one for hearing. But the auditory system has a number of more um, uh, synapses on the way from the ears to the, uh, the brain, including in the, uh, the, the brainstem. So this means that when information gets from the ears to the brain, it's gone through more processing stages uh, in various parts of the brain than in vision. The primary auditory cortex is the first cortical processing station of information uh, coming from the, the cochlea in the ears. This is found in a region called Heschel's gyrus in both the left and the right hemispheres in um, an upper part of the, the temporal lobes. As already mentioned, the primary auditory cortex contains something that called a tonotopic representation, which means that neurons within the primary auditory cortex respond to different frequencies of sound preferentially. And we know this from both brain imaging studies such as fMRI, but also single cell recordings from humans and other primates. What we also find in the auditory cortex is something of a hierarchical 
processing uh, of information going from simple to complex. So the central part of the auditory cortex is called the core, and beyond that there's a region called the belt, and then the parabelt. And these different um, anatomical regions process uh, increasingly complex uh, types of information. So the core region responds to sounds of uh, particular frequencies. So neurons might respond to a sound of 200 hertz, but not a sound of 300 hertz. As you move away from the central region, you'll find neurons that respond to more complex patterns. So you might find a neuron that responds to both 200 hertz and 300 hertz and 250 hertz. So it responds to a band of frequencies. And you could imagine this happening by pooling together more simple neurons coding just one frequency and then having a, a band of frequencies that, that it responds to. Or it might respond to a change in frequencies, so it might respond to a shift from 200 hertz to 300 hertz, a kind of a glide uh, pattern. And of course this is exactly the kinds of sounds that might be encountered in uh, human communication, in speech and maybe other kinds of sounds. cortex, it's argued that there are two main branches that process different kinds of auditory information. One branch is called a, uh, a where root or a ventral pathway and this is involved in understanding what the content of a sound is referring to. So in the case of speech it's involved in processing uh, words, uh, syllables, sentences uh, and so on. But for other sounds, it might involve detecting who is the speaker of a sound or whether it's a car or a bird that's making a particular noise. So the ventral stream is involved in detecting and understanding um, what is uh, within the, uh, the, the, the auditory signal. By contrast, the dorsal stream um, projects from the auditory cortex into the parietal lobes and this is involved in understanding where a sound is coming from and also in segregating a complex auditory stream made up of uh, several different sound sources into different auditory objects. We know this from evidence uh, from brain imaging. This includes fMRI uh, but also single cell recordings. We can look at the response properties of neurons in the, uh, the ventral stream, so going from the auditory cortex into the temporal lobes and show that neurons here respond according to what kind of sound is made. So in a primate it might be a difference between a coo and a ba or something like this. Whereas uh, neurons in the dorsal stream might respond, uh, might not care about whether it's sound A or sound B, but uh, respond according to whether a sound is coming from up here or from down there. So this supports this uh, kind of split between whether neurons are tuned to uh, the content of a sound versus um, they don't care about the content of the sound, they're more interested in where the sound uh, is located in space. So let's take a close look at the function of these different streams. So we can think of the ventral stream in terms of being important for processing speech. What we find is that different parts of the ventral stream are involved in different aspects of speech in something like a posterior to anterior gradient. So the more posterior parts of the ventral stream near the, near the primary auditory cortex are involved in fast changes in the speech stream. These might correspond to uh, phoneme level changes, so the difference between g and b and k, uh, for example. Beyond that, we find um, more slower changes that might correspond to syllable boundaries. So syllables occur approximately at 5 hertz, so 5 times a second, which corresponds to a good movement of the jaw in a human speaker, a biologically plausible movement of the jaw. Uh, and neurons here um, respond in a rhythmic kind of pulse. And we can see this from EEG, which has a very good temporal resolution, that neurons um, fire in terms of their electrical chemical properties at a similar rate in terms of the, the, the vibration of molecules in the air corresponding to uh, syllables. Going further along the ventral stream, we find uh, multiple syllable units, so things that occur across uh, three or four syllables, so stress patterns uh, in sentences. Uh, and all of these different um, units of time enable us to segment the incoming speech stream, so it enables us to predict where syllable boundaries and word boundaries are likely to appear. Looking more at the dorsal stream, 
The dorsal stream is involved in detecting where a sound comes from. There are several mechanisms for doing this. So obviously a sound um, located on the left is going to arrive at the two ears at slightly different times and it's perhaps going to be louder in the nearest ear than the furthest ear. So these are interaural um, differences that the brain can kind of extract in order to figure out where a sound is coming from. Another um, interesting property of the brain is that it can use distortions created by the head and the shape of the ears in order to figure out where sounds are. And of course this would be important to uh, detect the elevation of a sound which is uh, going to arrive at the, uh, the, the two ears at the same time. You can't use interaural time differences to figure out uh, the, the elevation. But what we find is that um, sounds high up would um, reverberate around the ears and the ear canal differently from a sound low down. And the brain can use, in effect, a model of the shape of the head in order to figure out where the sound is coming from, likely to be coming from above or below. Another claim made about the dorsal stream is that it can function as a how route as well as a where route. That is, it has motor properties as well as having spatial properties. So what might the motor properties of a sound be? Well, for simple sounds, such as a musical beat, we could imagine the motor property as being something like uh, a tendency to move, a particular pulse. Uh, and we can show that um, sounds with a, a strong rhythmic property are actually activating the motor cortex. So this enables us to synchronise uh, our motor activity with the movement of a sound, such as when we're dancing or producing music. Uh, for example, we've got the synchrony between the motor system and the auditory system. When we think of speech, we perhaps think of the how route as uh, serving a somewhat different function. So in the case of speech, the how route might be involved in verbatim repetition of uh, speech. So if I ask you to repeat back, a sentence exactly, then what you're effectively doing is you're translating the, the sounds into a particular motor um, the command. You don't necessarily have to understand the speech in order to repeat it back. I can give you nonsense syllables and this would involve an auditory to motor transformation that's using the how root. Whereas if I read you a story and asked you to repeat back the gist, here you would be taking out the meaning of the sounds, you would be processing it semantically and this would involve the ventral stream that goes from the auditory cortex along the temporal lobes into the anterior temporal lobes which has a particular importance in semantic memory.